that process now is 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 more conscious, you know, than it was for between dogs and wolves. It's conscious in the way that, you know, I come up with something, but I don't believe that it's like I'll have a new project idea, but I don't quite know how I'm going to do it. Weapon of War was shot in the DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo. And MSF um, called on me um, because they wanted portraits of women without their faces. And they were going to create this booklet that would be handed out to government officials, to soldiers, to NGOs, to everyone in the Congo to speak about the situation around women who had been sexually violated during the war and after by soldiers. I think it's very important to sit there and listen to the story because for me, the emotion of the story or the emotion of that person that comes out, while I'm sitting there, my brain's going tick, 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 I'm listening to the story, but at the same time, it's like, I'm absorbing it in a way to bring out the atmosphere through my photography about what they're speaking about. Because again, it's something that's happened. It's not happening before your eyes. So through the darkness of the photograph, or I mean, the one woman's praying, and but it's, it's not as literal, but I'm trying to bring that mood through in, in the photograph. So for me, I can't just say, I'll go outside and have a cigarette, you know, while you interview someone. I like to be there and hear everything. Every project, as I say, is different. It's like, I'm talking now artistically in the visual process of Congo. I mean, there you had a hut and I wasn't allowed to show a face. And I wanted to creatively not just have someone sit, you know, and so I worked with the light streaming in through the window. I shot in black and white. It was medium format. And MSF wanted to check every time so they would come and look to make sure that I wasn't photographing anyone's face. And that's, you know, how I, every time I do a project, it's, I perceive it in a different way. Lascanas was an incredible experience. It was for Positive Lives, the Terence Higgins Trust, who created it no longer exists, well, in the exhibition form, created exhibitions that would extend over time around different stories related to HIV AIDS. And I was with Network Photographers then, and um, they said I could go to Spain and it was about transmission of HIV AIDS through the use of drugs. I could go to a shelter in Barcelona or no one's ever been there and no one's ever got in. You can go to <laughs> this rubbish dump and try your best to get in to, they described it like a Mad Max situation. And it was exactly that. And it was an amazing experience. I spent a month there um, working in a huge rubbish dump where a thousand in Valencia on the outskirts, um, where um, about a thousand people frequent every day to buy drugs. Okay, there's this great, in, I mean, there's a great NGO that I worked with. But they first said to me, you know, you can come in, we go into it with a caravan, but I can't guarantee that you're going to be accepted. And I went in and I decided, you know, you couldn't walk around. I took my Nikon FM2s and I thought I was going to follow a few people around. But, you know, if you are hooked on drugs, you're not very reliable. And also, you know, every photograph that I was going to take would require permission. So I got hold of um, Frankie at uh, 
the agency and um, asked that I needed to get my yeshika mat and I decided I was going to do portraits because the thing is in a way it was a collaboration once again and I photographed there were about a hundred people who, who lived there and I decided to focus on, on the people there because they saw me there every day I arrived in the caravan and they would come up like through the dust <laughs> <laughs> Real characters to come get their kafi kolechi and their biscuits and their clean needles because that's what the NGO offered. And through that I started photographing everyone. And at the same time what I did was, it was in this huge rubbish dump so it was amazing because there were all these objects all over that people had thrown away. And so I started collecting them and that I photographed as well. Um, and it was very interesting because it, it's a whole world on its own. Well, the thing is, I think that, you know, it was like, there are lots of flies in that, in that very dry, um, dirty um, <laughs> rubbish dump. But in between, there's like a flower, a plastic flower, and there's, um, I don't know, like a little clock and um, a, a red shoe. And those, in a way, you can create and make your own stories around it. And it is part of the environment that, you know, the people were in. And I thought that it added something else to the work. And so it's trying to develop a story or telling something that's happening, but not maybe always in a very literal way. Five euros was a very significant piece of paper <laughs> because you could buy sex, you could buy drugs uh, and I could buy a photograph. I paid everyone and this was the NGO that recommended and it's very clear in the exhibition I photographed the five euros. It forms part of the uh, many pictures that I took but the deal was that if um, I was taking their time, the NGO said that, you know, you're living in another world while you're living here. And while they're scrounging and needing money, you're taking up their time. So that was the deal. For five euros, I could photograph them. But I didn't photograph everyone, like, in a line and whatever. For being in a month, in a rubbish dump, where you've got flies and nothing else, you start seeing and I used to stand there and just watch everyone and I couldn't work with a translator coming in from somewhere else so I would work with different drug addicts who were living there. Um, it had to change at times because uh, someone was arrested or didn't arrive or you know there were all these things and I mean, obviously there was some form of manipulation because when you're in that world, it's like a big brother house, you know, who's staying and who's going. And it's a manipulation around how am I getting my next fix? So they were very aware of what I was doing. I mean, that's the biggest thing that I tried to do is create an awareness why I'm there. You know, and the one day it was very interesting because the deal was, and this was from the drug dealers, I mean the drug addicts themselves, it was the law of the land that when I photographed it was with permission. I couldn't walk around and just snap away and one day about 40 people were falling and dropping to the ground because of bad drugs. And you know you, as a photographer you see like this very dramatic photograph in front of you but in my brain, I thought to myself, Jody, what did they say? That if you take this picture, you're going to be kicked out of there. For one photograph, is that one photograph telling the whole story? Or are your portraits and objects going to say as much? And I just put the cameras down and I helped the NGO. I know that some people prefer to have a more literal interpretation, but... Um, I think for me, I'm moving more and more into, you know, letting the viewer have more of the interpretation through the photograph than it just being 
force fed onto the person. I was walking through Old Street Tube Station and your head's down because the weather's bad and all of a sudden I came across this advert, this big ad with ordinary woman in white underwear with lumps and bumps and all of that and it's like I've just stood there like wow you know and then um, I heard a BBC radio interview and it spoke about how in South Africa more young black women were had found the Western body shape to be more desirable. And then I met this high-flying model going from London uh, to Paris, and she had bags under her eyes, and she said, ah, oh, it doesn't matter, you know, in Photoshop, they'll just remove it. And she opened up Vogue or one of these magazines, and she told me, and this one has this bump, and this one has this lump, and this one has this scar. And, but you don't see that in the magazine. They just look perfect. And I was moving back to South Africa, and I think also being in my 40s, you know, and feeling more comfortable with myself. Um, that was another reason that I wanted to do the project. So when I got back to South Africa, I started asking women, you know, would they pose uh, for me in their underwear? And that's, most women looked at me as if I was about to create a pornographic site or something. So what I did was I created a little pamphlet, a leaflet, and I spoke about my beliefs um, around the project and exactly what I, I told you now. And I gave my telephone number. And I was very clear that South Africa has many different cultures and I wanted many different economic backgrounds. So I was strategical in where I placed my notice. And I went to universities, I went to community centres, I went to gyms, and people started to phone me. And I decided not to discriminate and say, well, let me meet you first to see if I want to do photograph you. So whoever phoned me, I met and I photographed them. There were conditions. The condition was that I didn't mind what underwear you wore. How you stood was your choice, because I can't tell you to stand in a specific way. And the only condition really was that the, I wanted to photograph you in your space because the background for me tells me so much about who you are. And then I went about and I started photographing different women and it became really interesting to see how do we pose. You know, are we posing for men? Are we posing, referencing to the magazines that we've grown up? Are we posing to like the music videos we've been watching? You know, and as being a serious documentary photographer, here I would arrive and one girl, there were five or six friends with wine and food platters. And I thought to myself, just go with the process. You know, this is fine. You're serious and all, but this is all part of it. Everyone had a response to this work. You know, it was exhibited, people who had never been in a gallery decided to go and see this work. And it was incredible to see the response, be it good or bad. I mean, there were all types of responses. And I think that it's important for people to respond to your work. And I think that for many, many, many women out there, it's really, it was a very liberating experience to actually not only for the women that were in the project because sometimes I didn't always know what their intention was I think they were challenging themselves you know but for women that were viewing the project there was so much positive really strong approach you know response to it and yeah that's what I want from my work and obviously I feel strongly about what real beauty has to, to say. Before I was more like a fly on the wall and more, you know, 35 more and capturing that. And I can still do that. But for some reason I like the collaboration. I like us working together and not just hanging out and being quiet and recording what's going on. I very much enjoy working with you to decide how we're going to 
capture you, you know, where we're going to put you. And for me, working with you to try and capture the essence of who you are. So it's not something that start, I started with, it's just how it developed. Well, portraiture is more of a collaboration. I mean, you're speaking to the person, you're collaborating, and you know, they're very much part of that process. Where when you being more just documenting the work, it's you take the more invisible approach and you just recording what you see before you. And that's I think ultimately the biggest difference. And it's not to say in, in documentary photography you also interpreting you know, what you actually choose to photograph and what you include in your frame. Um, it's, it's just two different ways of, you know, like here we sitting in a way, it is a portrait of me and you've put the studio lights, you've chosen where I am standing and you've, we've worked together to create this interview where if you were just following me around, you would just be the invisible one in a way. And I would lead you where we're going, but together we're leading each other. And I, I sort of like that. And I think that as photographers, you know, if I don't believe we're machines, that I was quite okay with the documentary side of it, you know, but I believe that it's to challenge yourselves, you know, here we sit in an era where we have multimedia and we have sound and we have video and we have a whole lot of things to work with and I don't believe we need to be rigid in our thinking, you know, I think we have the opportunity to explore. I've moved a lot more into telling stories through portraiture. It's just, it's not, it's actually documentary. Portrait, portraiture for me can be incorporated actually into documentary. And when I went to New York to see Time, I had my work on Real Beauty in Soweto. And then I got a call to say that, you know, would I go to Afghanistan? Erin um, Baker had written a story, she's there writer and she was living between Pakistan and Afghanistan and she had found about 17 different women that I was going to photograph and off I went and Aisha was one of the women that I was going to photograph. I photographed um, the Oprah Winfrey of Afghanistan, I photographed politicians, I photographed documentary filmmakers, I went uh, to a park it's, it's an image of a young girl in a beautiful little dress with green in the background, um, which isn't a typical photograph that you would see coming out of Afghanistan, but it was a variety of different women, and then I photographed Aisha. And I think that when, as a photographer, you bring your history with you, is that if I did that photo maybe, 15 years ago, I probably would have taken it in a more distressing way. I probably would have taken it in a more typical way. I would have shown her probably more vulnerable and not as powerful. And maybe that's also my journey.